Welcome to Impact Church Online, where we are one church in many houses. My name is Sean Frazier, and I'm your Impact Online pastor. And if this is your first time, I would like to extend a special welcome to you. At Impact Church, you will discover a family of believers who are applying the word and striving daily to grow as followers of Jesus Christ. So if you're looking for a consistent word that challenges every aspect of your life, then join the Impact family. All you have to do is text the word JOIN to 908-332-5407 or click the JOIN button in the chat so we can connect with you. Today, I am excited about the word that our Bishop DeAndre Salter shared with us back in September 2019. In this message, Bishop challenges us to go vertical and draw closer to God in spite of everything that is going on around us. So get ready for this powerful message entitled, Higher. I'll see you after the sermon. How many of you want to be closer to God? And as predicted, we could all predict, most would answer that question if you were in church on Sunday morning, that has something to do with your desire to be closer to God. But I need you to process that for a second. Because we live in a day and age of superficial religion. Where, where the culture has caused us to relinquish the position of holiness. See, my Pentecostal holiness roots won't let me get away from he that is holy. Let him still be holy. Which means the text implies there's no age or generation where holiness don't work. Yes, that begs the question, what does this holiness look like in my day and age? But we are not to argue that he that is holy, let him still be holy. And I fear that we have, we have wandered away into the devil's traps to get us to lay down our holiness. Knowing that when you walk away from the holiness of God, you make yourself most vulnerable. You open yourself up to all the wiles, the Bible describes, of the devil. And God still calls us in 2019 to navigate and wrestle with what this holiness looks like. And the reason why I ask the question is why you want to be closer to God is because to be closer to God, here's what you got to realize. To draw closer to God is for him to draw closer to you. But God is holy. Which means as he draws closer to me, he is pulling me into his holiness. Not us pulling him into our holy mess. And we don't want to wrestle with this. Because we live in an individualistic, self-determined society where, where we, we celebrate phrases like, do you. That's not even communal. It goes against even our culture. It's all about you. Will we, will we self-grandize our exploits of how we made it by ourselves and how no one helped us and, and, and it's your thing and, 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 and God, God, God loves you no matter what. He does love you no matter what. He loves every single person from the serial killer to the saint. That's why he so loved the world he gave his only son. But that does not mean he doesn't want us holy. Oh. <sighs> children of God, this series on higher. See, I've been prophesying over you something real. and you've, Some of you have already been walking the manifestations that when the season of release and elevation brings blessing with it. But I don't want you to be immature and realize uh, that you're going to get blessed without the devil testing that. See, in the season of blessing, you don't go lower, you go higher. 
You draw closer to the blessor who has released the blessings. You don't stray away. You don't let the blessings of the Lord in your life and in your family and in your career and in your title take you away from the very God who gave you all that stuff in the first place. See, some of us have put everything in front of them. And if you like me and you're honest and you're one of the real ones, you can admit that you have found yourself lonely, isolated. Some of you are hanging on and you can't even pray right anymore. Because you don't even feel his presence. I'm encouraging you, saints. It's because you've got to go vertical. got to go higher. I I, I want you to stand with me. We're going to do this old school. The way I used to do it when I was a little boy. We're going to recite. Y'all know what recite means? Some of you new saints don't know what recite means. You folk online, join us. They recite. If you're online and watching this, get your Bible, stand up in your living room, and I want you to recite with me the 91st Psalm. Now, because y'all got all those fancy phones and all them different translations, I'm going to put it on the screen, and we're going to read it together, the 91st Psalm, okay? We're going to read this together, everybody in the New King James Version. We're going to read not the whole thing. We're going to read the popular version, because some of us know it only ends at verse 8. <laughs> verse 9 don't matter. It ends at verse 8. That's all we know. So we're just going to do up to that part. Here we go. Ready? Go. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers And under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near thee. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Stop. Give God some praise for the reading of his word. I love it. Take your seats. Some of you are on autopilot. You, y'all was going to the King James Version. Shall not come nigh thee. Only with that shall thou behold. <laughs> I'm going to take you back. If you watch the trail of the text, the psalmist is bringing us into a viewpoint of life, not where there is no trouble, but the psalmist is bringing us into a viewpoint of life where there is suffering and there is trouble. For the psalmist, there is no world that exists without trouble. And I I need you to wrestle with that. Because you might fault like me in times in my past where things have gone wrong and I accuse God of being absent. And in fact, was angry with him in seasons, not just because he was absent, because it seemed like he was cruel for letting it happen in the first place. I'm preaching now. But I, want, I, 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 I aim to be like the psalmist because the psalmist assumes that in a fallen world there's fallen troubles. And the psalmist bifurcates and does not attribute to God nor his holiness nor his character of love uh, these sufferings. He attributes them to, to, to the rightful party to blame. He attributes them to pestilence and dangers and things that come from an opposing force, an opposing enemy, one who really is against us, and his name is the devil. And the psalmist seems to understand the, the narrative that, that, that we had what we needed. And all we needed was to be in the presence of God, walking in the garden, walking with him. And we aborted that and forfeited that to listen to a lie of Satan. And as it was then, it is now. 
We still have safety and security in the presence of God. And yet Satan draws us away with his lies. And this is the concern for the psalmist. The psalmist, the psalmist is trying to get us um, to move higher and go vertical. Look, if you look at the text, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide. Taking notes, the only thing the psalmist is trying to get you to see is that the higher you go into the presence of God, there is security. What kind of security? Um, security as a promise not to everybody, by the way, but the promise of Psalm 91 is security from all these things that happen in the fallen world for those who will do what? Dwell. Those who will abide. So look at that. Dwell and abide. Where? So this is for the people. Watch this. The solution provided in Psalm 91 only works for those who want to stay in a place. Watch this. In other words, the psalmist sees there is a trouble when we don't dwell, when we don't abide. What do I mean by dwell? The word dwell in the Hebrew there is is not to be taken um, as a hotel stay. That's not dwelling. It is not to be taken, the word dwell there or the word abide there, as you visiting my house and you just stopping by. See, some of us, some of us are, are stuck in a relationship where we just stopping by Jesus. But the psalmist says that's problematic because the world is too fallen and the devil is too vicious for me to just be stopping by somewhere. The, the Bible says, he that dwell, or for those of you who like that King James, dwelleth. See, a dwell or dwelling is a home. Oh, my God. Shut that up. It's a picture. Watch this, children. Look at your neighbor and say, you don't have to stay in the hallway. God says, come on in the room. That's the well. You know, you don't have to ring the doorbell of God and act like a stranger and stay in the hallway. The psalmist says, uh, there, there's a dwelling. There, there's, an, uh, there's an abode. There's a way you can abide. It's, it's the picture uh, of, of, of extended stay. I want you to get the picture in your mind of a relationship that's not, I'm stopping by, but watch this. God has given you the guest room. He's going to set up a room for you. You can sleep in the living room, or you can sleep on God's, on God's, in God's spare room. Jesus said, my father's house, there are many rooms. That's dwell. He said, if it wasn't true, I wouldn't tell you this. Trying to encourage us in this concept of dwell. He said, so, so watch this. So watch this. It's the picture of proximity. Some of us are missing this picture because we're being transient in our relationship with God. We're, we're visiting him on Sunday mornings. See, to dwell and to abide means to stay in. Oh, I'm about to help you. Uh, you ever wondered why you got high and lifted up on Sunday morning? And then you woke up on Monday, and it seemed like the devil got worse. That's the sign that you need to stay in where you were. That's the second terms that are counterbalanced in this text is secret place and shadow. In other words, where do we dwell? We dwell in the place where we can find God. Somebody say higher. In other words, the psalmist, children, is not getting at a worship service where we experience God for a moment. He's talking about the difference between singing a worship song and living a worship life. See, because if you can just sing a worship song, when you go through suffering and trials, you'll stop singing and start complaining. Oh, but they who dwell in the secret place got worship deep down in their soul. And even though it might be a storm, they're singing through the storm. Can 
you praise God in the middle of it? Can, that's dwelling. I'm not letting the devil get me outside of God's house. I'm not letting the devil get me outside of God's presence. I don't care what you say. I'm staying in his presence. I got to go higher. Oh. It says dwell in a secret place, not any place. The place of the most high. The most high, Elyon, the most high. He says, oh, I taught you this last week. Shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Another name for God. Actually, the psalmist uses in the eight verses we read four names for God. To get at its vastness. He calls him the most high, Elyon in Hebrew. He calls him, he calls him, he calls him the Almighty, El Shaddai. You know what El Shaddai means after last week. It is it's that picture of, of the mercies of God showing up. It's God making himself present and known. And, and so the psalmist says, the psalmist says, the place where you need to dwell, where you can get out of the enemy's traps and stay away from the devil, and the place that's the safest for you, hear me, saints, the safest place for you is in the presence of El Shaddai. The Lord God Almighty. And some of you will wrestle with this and you go, yeah, but I was praying. And I was praying. But see, watch this. I, I know you was praying and you sang a song, but my question is, did you stay there? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. your problem is you don't know how to stand still. <laughs> Told Jehovah's right. see, stand and see the salvation. You won't see it if you won't stand. Oh, I'll let a preach to you next week. Some of you left that place of prayer too soon. You left that reading too soon. You left that worship too soon. You got a microwave mentality. And if God didn't move in 30 seconds, you abandoned them. And if God let you be just a teensy, eensy, weensy bit like Jesus, you abandoned him. Let me tell you what God did with Jesus. He allowed him to get up on the cross. How do you think you're not supposed to suffer? You're better than Jesus? The nerve of you. The arrogance. The, the, the hubris of you. To ever complain with God about your suffering when you didn't get up on no cross. Yes, you got up on your cross, but you didn't get up on the cross. And you're still breathing. And you're still living. Which means God did his job. And what the devil meant to kill you and destroy you, El Shaddai showed up. And you got a nerve to complain. See, you, see, see, that's what the devil do. He wants to draw you out of the secret place with trouble. He want to draw you out of the shadow. Get, get the picture. The shadow, watch this. The shadow is a picture. The best picture I can give you is of the shadow of God. It's, it's being under the wings of God like a mother hen walking with chicks on the yard. The chicks stand up, watch this, close to the mother hen, and the mother hen warps her wings and walks with the chicks. up. The chicks walk up under the shadow. God says, I want to walk with you. But God, why can you have created the world without sin and trouble? He did. <laughs> Your complaint is already signed. He did that. But why did you give us free will? Because he wanted to. Yeah. I want my kids to love me by choice. Yeah. Really wouldn't be love if I made them do it. Come on, some of y'all know how it is. Uh, come on, mama's in the room. You, you know you asked for a glass of ice water and you sent it back. <laughs> Baby, go get me a glass of ice water. And you move all slow and act like you was, you was too bothered to get mama. Never mind, I get my own ice water. Or you got to whoop it, one or the other. <laughs> because that was that, that's mama's way of saying, if you can't do this right, don't do it at all. Do it because you love me, not because you're scared of me, not because I forced you to. As it is for her, as it is for God. You get a choice. 
From the beginning, you got a choice, and we get a choice now. And so you can't blame the devil. You can't blame your neighbor. You can't blame nobody else when you chose like a chick to get from under the shadow. I'm trying to call you higher. Higher is also protection. So there's a safety and a comfort of knowing, there's a security in knowing that the Lord El Shaddai is very present and he'll walk with me on the yard and cover me. But higher is also protection. And it's very interesting how the psalmist shifts gears and he's almost responding to the first verse, which is a declarative statement on who God is and what his relationship is to those who will dwell in his presence. And I love it. He says, he says, he says in verse 2, I will say of the Lord. I will say it. I'm not going to wait for my neighbor to say it. Watch this. I'm not going to wait for the preacher to tell me to say it. This ain't no talk to your neighbor part right here. This is something that's got to be deep down in your soul. This is something you got to declare. Watch this. From having been in the shadow and having been abiding and knowing as you walk through troubles and sufferings that you weren't by yourself, that God was with you. This is this is a declaration of the psalmist to say, I will say he is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my God. In him will I trust. He is. What do you say God is? The psalmist has declared him a refuge. The psalmist has declared him a fortress. The the psalmist has claimed him, not disowned him because of suffering. The psalmist says, in spite of it all, that's my God. Don't you talk about my God because that's my God. Who do you say God is? What, what, what is that relationship you would describe to somebody else? Would you describe the Lord as your refuge? By the way, the psalmist switches here from getting these homey, comfy terms like abide and dwell, and he now gives us militaristic terms. Because now the psalmist is starting to recognize another side. He gives us two more names for God. He says, Yahweh, I will say of the Lord. He is my refuge and my God, Elohim, the living God. He's not dead. He's not a statue. He's alive and he goes to battle for me. So while he gives me safety, he gives me protection. And and here's the protection. Here's the protection. He says, he gives me refuge. You know what a refuge is? Some of you need this right now. Some of you are worn out by life. You are physically tired all the time. You are mentally exhausted trying to keep up with the world's labels and what they've tried to tell you. Half of us are half confused, don't know who we are because we're trying to find our place in a world where everything, the definitions change every week. One minute it's a LBTQ plus. I ain't against any of it. I'm just saying at the end of the day, you keep adding plus, then you're going to add Z, then you're going to add T, he, she, him, pronouns. We can't figure out who we are in this day and age. Everybody keeps defining us. You're either black, you're white, you're Republican, you're Democrat, you're racist, you're this, you're not, you're liberal, you're that, you're, you're a bohemian, you're a hipster. We got all these labels, all these labels getting in our head and, 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 and we're losing our place, losing our minds. But the psalmist says, in the midst of a world that tries to define you a hundred different ways, comes a time in your life where you need a refuge from that. Might I suggest God? The proper way, not the way the president and the current administration are doing it. When you do it from a humanitarian standpoint, a refugee camp is meant to not be a place of torture and lack. It's meant to be a place of abundance from being in a war-torn area. 
You don't need no refugee camps in a free country. At least you shouldn't. That's the picture here. If the Lord says, out there is war and torn, in my presence is refuge. Is there anybody here on their last? What you need is a refuge. You need to get into the presence of the Lord. You need to go higher with this. Watch this. Protection is like a hedge. I'm about to bless you so good. And we all declare the hedge of the Lord be around us. We sing songs about Lord, be a hedge around me every day. Some of us, our problem is God has moved the hedge. It's still there, but it's higher. You're saying to yourself, well, where is God in this right now? God gave you that hedge for that season because of where you were as a baby. But as you grow up, the hedge moves up. And God will move the hedge to the next level where you need to be. That's where your protection is. But some of us stay down here in immaturity and wonder why we're going through. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to go higher. That's why Paul would tell, would tell the saints, when I was a child, I thank like a child. I drank like a child. I ate like a child. Well, I'm a grown man now. What you need to protect a grown person is not what you need to protect a child. The Bible says, another military term. Not only is he a refuge, he is a fortress. But I want you to think about this picture. The picture provided here is the picture of a mountain fortress. One built into solid rock up upon a high ground on a mountain, built into a mountain where the enemy has no way to climb up. But you have all the means to pour down terror on the enemy. And the Bible says, the Bible says, the psalmist says, and the Lord is my fortress. He, he, watch this, not only does he give me refuge and he, he gives me a place where I can go and be fed and restored in his presence, but the protection is he fights for me. He defends me. Watch this. So he is higher as safe security, higher as protection. Now, the psalmist is about to tell us in the next verses from verse 3 to 13, he's going to prove his point and elaborate just in case we don't understand what he's talking about, all the different ways that God defends us. So he's trying to reveal to us that not only is there security and there's protection, um, but the devil's defeated when you go higher. Some of you have a devil that needs defeating right now. So he says in verse 3, we're going to end here. Surely, God shall deliver you from the snare of the follower and from the perilous pestilence. He shall deliver you from two things. The follower's snare and from pestilence. Let's work with the first thing. The first thing, a fowler is a bird catcher. That's all that it means. Okay? But the revelation... You look at this picture of an ancient bird catcher. The revelation is how and for what reasons the bird is caught. So the psalmist says, watch this. The psalmist says, God will deliver me. Elohim, the living God, will deliver me from the devil's traps. What kind of trap? The same trap that a hunter uses or a bird catcher uses to catch a bird. Well, what kind of trap is that? Watch this. Um, uh, the, the bird trap is, is, first of all, a trap that is a hidden trap. There ain't nothing you did to get in a trap. But the trap was set for you even though you didn't do anything. Oh, I'm trying to help you. Well, I'm always going through. Um, because there, there is a hunter getting after you. And whether you recognize you being hunted or not, there's still a hunting taking place. And watch this. The hunter's deceptive. The hunter's good. The hunter puts the, a fowler's trap you put in the grass. 
and is made of a web of nets. Watch this. And so the way the bird gets caught in the fowler's trap is aimlessly, the bird innocently doing nothing flutters down into the trap. Looking for worms, doing what birds are supposed to do, trying to feed itself, provide for itself, take care of its family. All the bird doing is doing bird stuff. And the bird doing bird stuff flutters down, living life, unbeknownst to it, woke up that morning to get the early bird. He heard the same phrase you heard. The early bird gets the first worm. So he goes down and he flutters. And without seeing it, he steps into it. Look at your neighbor and say, what have you stepped in? You ever find yourself having stepped in it? You know you're in it now. The fowl wants to. Because what happened? Oh, I got to help you. See, a fowler does not catch the bird to kill it. A f- the, the trap is an entanglement. He ain't trying to kill you. He's trying to detain you. Some of the greatest work of the devil is to just keep you from getting where you're going on time. This is why you got to keep staying. This is why you got to stay. This is why you, watch this, watch this. Uh, the trap gets on the feet of the bird so the bird can't fly high no more. The devil will entangle you in some mess that will bring your spirit down to the ground. And you can't lift your hand. And you can't fly. And you can't pray. And you can't lift your hand. Oh, but the Bible says. Surely. That only means something to the faithful in the room. That is, I know that I know that I know. I done stepped up in it. I didn't mean to step in it. I didn't mean to make this mistake. I didn't mean to get caught. I didn't mean to get entangled. I didn't mean for my spirit to fall. I didn't mean to be in this place. I didn't mean to be in this season of my life. No, it's not working out like I wanted to. But don't you leave God when you're stuck in the trap. Surely he shall. Deliver me. Watch this. In the Hebrew, the word delivered there, it has more than a few meanings, but one of the meanings is to be plucked out of. The trap got me. But because... I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Even when I get stuck doing stuff I didn't even mean to do, God plucks me out. He detangles the enemy's entanglement and he gets me out. One meaning for deliverance there is to remove me from. You know you are delivered when, when he has removed you from it. Anybody here been removed? Oh, I need somebody to give God some glory. Who has God plucked out in this place? Who has God rescued in this house? Who has God saved in this house? Amen. Amen. What a powerful word. And just as Bishop just finished preaching, The Lord wants us to go higher. And for some of you today, higher is accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Higher is recognizing that you need him to take the lead. You need a relationship with him. And Romans 10 and 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you want to go higher today and accept Jesus, then I just simply need for you to repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, I believe you died for me. Jesus, 
I believe you rose for me. Jesus, I believe that you are coming back for me. Jesus, forgive me of my many sins. Thank you for saving me. In your name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on and celebrate with our brothers and sisters that just made that great decision. Hey, you were a big deal to Jesus, and you're also a big deal to us. Listen, if you made that decision today, we want you to fill out your next step card by clicking the button in the chat. Or you can also simply hit that button that says, I just committed my life to Jesus. We're looking to celebrate with you. We're looking to connect with you and give you the next steps on your new found journey. Amen, amen. All right, so listen, we want to learn about what's going on at Impact. So Sherry, go ahead and give us the announcements for the week. Today at 1 p.m., Pastor Nancy can't wait to party with kids ages 3 through 12 at a 15-minute iKids Zoom party. You bring the kids, and the iKids team will handle the rest. Just click the iKids card on our website to get logged in. Okay, here are some ways you can connect with us this week. On Wednesday, there's prayer, small groups are on Thursday, and then on Friday, there's a virtual team meetup. Don't forget that our prayer call center is open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and on Sunday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. All the details about these events can be found on churchforimpact.com. Remember, we're one church and many houses, so be intentional about staying connected. Thanks, Sherry. We want to thank you all for your generous hearts. Just know when you give, know that you are not just partnering with Impact, but with God. Your generous hearts are moving ministry forward as well as the kingdom. We have two ways that you can give here at Impact Church Worldwide. And you can give just by simply going to www.churchforimpact.com and clicking give at the top of your screen or you can go into the chat and just click on the Give tab and you will be able to give right here on our platform. I know you can't wait to give. So before you do, let's set our hearts and minds by reciting our financial faith confession. Holy Father, all I have and am belong to you. I will not spend everything on myself because Christ is my Lord. My heart is committed to your kingdom and not to the systems of the world. I am determined to increase in generosity. I am determined to be trustworthy with money so that you may trust me with true riches as I reflect you in my tithing to Impact Church. I know, Father, you will give back to me in abundance. I walk by faith in all things and not by sight. Knowing as I follow your plan, your blessings will soon overtake me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Swell family, it has certainly been a great day. Thank you for inviting us into your homes. Hey, I'm definitely striving to go higher, and I pray that you are deciding to do the same thing. I look forward to seeing you next week, the same time, 8.30 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great week.